folks watching us uh, through Facebook live stream. Later on, maybe YouTube. We are on YouTube. You know, you can catch that later in the week when I appreciate Greg's efforts of getting that up and things. And he's got a young man in training back there, brother uh, Jake, getting him trained up to help do the sound and things. But uh, it's good to see each of you today. And maybe as you came in and you got your bulletin, you noticed that there was an insert. Ladies, this is for you. This is what came from our uh, women's uh, Bible study here, ladies' Bible study this past month. I'll be meeting with you all again come the second Tuesday of April. And uh, we'll be looking at this. But this was the form that's come out. So ladies, please take... You don't have to put your name, but you can if you want to. Fill this out, uh, whatever of interest to you. Read it, check mark it, the things of interest that you have uh, that applies to you or that you'd like to see or any ideas that you have concerning uh, women's ministry here at Orchard Crest Baptist Church. And then just fold it back up, drop it in that five-gallon bucket back there. Miss Joy, make sure I get that or anybody counting the money, things that you'll give that back to the office, please so that I get all these forms um, as we're looking at and, and be sharing with you all latest ministry and, and with the church about what we're going to try to offer. And that depends upon your choices, the leadership. So you can look at that. Now, the devil almost made me do it. I mean, you know how he is. He's very, very, you know how he is, Brian. You know how the old devil can just really, you know, you and I get it. We just, but I was going to say men, if y'all wanted to help them making choices, you know, uh, don't overload, don't, don't stuff the ballot box here within, no men can vote on this thing, okay? Uh, but, I mean, who's to say if there's no names on it or whatever? Uh, just kidding, of course, just kidding. But uh, I did see something on aerobics and uh, uh, things like that and different uh, Zumba and... Uh, don't you men be marking any of that right there for the girls here. You'll, uh, you'll get in trouble. I'm trying to warn you. If I see that, buddy, I'm telling you. No. But anyway, love you. I appreciate you all and uh, appreciate doing that. Um, Saturday. This coming Saturday, we're going to try to have a work day here at the church. If you can come and help us out, we'd appreciate that. Uh, we'll work whoever we got that you can come. I understand if you can't. Make it 9 o'clock Saturday morning, and we'll do some work on the outside. There's some weeding and lawn stuff that we need to take care of, getting everything to get ready to beautify and things on the front of the church, getting it all ready for Easter Sunday's coming, two weeks away. And also on the inside. So if you're coming, we need our baptistry cleaned. And I talked to Michelle, and uh, we'll do some cleaning in the nurseries, the two nursery rooms to come and sanitizing that and getting that all cleaned up for those two rooms. We can focus on that and with the toys and things. So please come, bring whatever you need to bring and um, be here. And of course, we'll need to mask, you know, as much as possible when you're working, being around, staying safe in that uh, sense of the way too. Update on the basement. We did make our goal. We got an, our, our deductible met. Thank you so much for that, uh, meeting the deductible. Thank the Lord, and uh, appreciate that. And where we are in the work, they have taken up carpet in like four or five rooms. I can't remember, but we're waiting. They took up, cut the drywall down where it was wet, about two feet high from the floor all the way down through the affected areas that have to be put back and fixed and painted and things when they get after, before they get the carpet stuff down. But they're waiting to try to match the carpet to the hallway carpet. If they can't, that's what our holdup is. And um, if they can't find a match, they'll have to take up all the hallway carpet and put down a, you know, the carpet to match there. So moving, moving along, just slow. We're not in any big hurry race on that. Um, there was something else I was going to say, but it skipped my mind. Do you know what it was? Um, we want to, maybe I can think of it here. We want to remember Brother Robert McCleary's wife, Estella. Uh, she's in Mercy Hospital right now. She'll be going to uh, Maple Rehab here probably sometime this week, so pray for her. 
Pray for Sister Norma Anderson. Continue lifting her up. Her tests come out pretty good, I think, didn't they, Beal? And, um, and uh, Keith Small, their nephew that we remembered that has cancer, remembering him in prayer as well. We want to pray for each other, pray for our country, and uh, pray the Lord just bless us today as we share together uh, and touch our hearts as we worship him. Pray with me. Thank you, Father, for your blessings. Just lead and guide us, Lord, in all that we do. May we bring glory to you. Bless us through the word, through the songs, and just draw us closer, Father, that fills our cups with your Holy Spirit and the love of Jesus, for we pray in his name, amen. And don't forget, any time during the um, songs, um, uh, you can drop your offering into the bucket uh, there, and it did remind me, there was one, I did remember what I was going to say. Someone challenged me about putting principal, uh, extra principal, they were going to give $100 toward the principal our building fund. Some of you do that right now, you put offerings in the, you know, for the principal, we appreciate that. But he said, why don't we just, this happened in our uh, meeting the other night at the finance committee meeting, and said, if we just put challenge to say, every family to give a dollar extra a week, or you want to be a dollar member, or a $5 member, or a $10 member a week, but whatever that you would commit to putting towards the principal. Now you have to indicate that when it goes in, that it's going towards the principal, and how much quicker that that will help us in paying our building debt. I think we owe about 180000 is it? Something like that. And I want to, maybe that's what we can do on work day Saturday is clean that sign up a little bit and bring it down here by the water fountain so you can see where we are with our building debt, and we could see as we bring up the debt of, you know, getting out of that. Wouldn't that be great? So uh, anyway, just be praying about it, and I appreciate it. For the Philip. Come on, ladies, uh, men, come on up. You'd like to... Dexes <laughs> and things, uh, we got up there to Mark. Hey, Sharon. Huh? No? Chicken? Anybody else wants to join singing? No? I see any takers? How many more spots? I've got another spot right over there for an X. We can always put more. Anybody else want to join up there to sing? All right, be praying about it. All right, well, let's stand and sing to the Lord this morning. We'll start with Victory Jesus.
Philip, if that be all right with you, brother, could we uh, switch that invitation song and repeat that one right there for invitation? Greg, if you've got the words back there, can fix me up later on. I mean, that's just such a beautiful song, isn't it? I do it. Goes so well with the message. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to open them to the Gospel of Luke. We'll be reading chapter 23, verse 
39 through verse 49. The title of the message today is, You Can Trust God With Yourself. You Can Trust God With Yourself. Luke chapter 23, beginning with verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today. Did you notice that? Not tomorrow. The moment you die. When do I go to heaven? Today. When you die, that moment that you take that last breath, Jesus says, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. And when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And all the people that came together to that sight, and just a little excerpt, insert there, and there would have been many. All the people that came together to that sight, notice this, beholding the things which were done, smote their breast and returned. They knew they were saying, this is unjust. This is not right. This is whatever, and what a shame. All the things, they were smoting their, all the people that were there. Does say, this wasn't, notice the next verse. And all his acquaintances, and the women that followed him from Galilee, that was the women, that was the apostles, the disciples, that was the ones, the group of his inner circle, of all those there. They were standing afar off. And it said, beholding all these things. Pray with me. Father, I want to thank you for your spirit that's in this place right now, your presence. Thank you for your divine word. And as we've lifted up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, give us understanding of your word today and touch our hearts, Lord, and help us to make full surrender of our lives that we know that we may not be able to trust all the different things going on around, but we can trust you. Help us to trust ourselves into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't think that there was ever a time of a scene that was so ghastly and both in physical horror and in the moral atrocity, then at the time when Jesus, the sinless one, was put to death by brutality and bigotry. Of all the things that happened here, we look. You see, to the world, I think the death of Christ spoke of utter defeat. You could see it in the faces of those that walked away that they really didn't believe. When the crowd was looking around, and even, yes, take note that that one was saying, but yet he didn't know, but the words of Christ that was coming from the cross, and as they looked at this, they would look at it in a sense of, of, of just, to them, it was over. It was the end of a good run. You know, all the things that was had So realistically, however, this event, I think, combined with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, actually brought forth the greatest victory the world has ever seen because these, 
last words of Jesus are perhaps, uh, as we look at it, interpreted by some as a parting wrench of pain. They would say, oh, that it's over for him. He suffered so much. And that's what we look at in death a lot of times to say, well, they're, at least they're no longer in pain. They're no longer in suffering. When they come to that place to give up, take that last breath, and loved ones are standing beside them. And there's a sense of relief that comes to us, though there is great sadness when people come to that place. But actually... Those last words of Jesus was not only a prayer of relief and of mercy that was offered by death, but it was also a cry of joyful victory that Jesus had endured to the end and completely fulfilled God's purpose for him in this life. There are three thoughts that I want us to remember today in the message. Number one, most everyone, perhaps all people, get this, die as they live. Think about that for a moment. Most people, if not all people, die as they live. As I stated before, last words that people speak on earth are significant. The last things they say, this, when somebody dies, they say, well, did he say anything? Sometimes people have reasons for asking concerning a person's saying. Did they, did they say, Lord, come into my heart and save me? Or, or did they say, I, I wish I had lived a better life? Did they say, I'm sorry for how I treated you? I'm, the, all kinds of things that would come. When you think about the last words of a person that says are significant because that carries on for you the rest of your life until you die. Because you remember those things. You, you might forget everything else they said. But you see, here in all seriousness, when it comes to that place to understand. And I think these people who have been skeptical or critical probably think sometimes with um, this famous words of hobbits who mentioned and said, he said this in his death. His last words was, I'm going to take a leap in the dark. And I commit my body to the worms and my spirit to the great, perhaps. You see, I don't know if he's real or not. I don't know if there's a God out there. That's what he is saying. There's so many that say, and they live their life as such say, but if there is a God, and they have these things in their minds, because, but yet they go ahead and live as the world would live, live in a way that is pleasing to them and things, and then when it comes to the place that here's but just in case, others have, who have been constant seekers of greater understanding, there was a great scholar named Gothi, and he said, when he died, more light, more light. As he was reaching out, you heard people saying that when they die, they see this great light or, or things that happens. And honestly, I have to tell you, I've had some experiences of being in rooms with people who were dying and it seemed just everything became bright. There was, and there was just such a, a, a sensation of warmth and, and, and just the, this love, the things that was taking place when this person was taking who loved the Lord, lived for the Lord, given their life to them, that in this time of of just get letting go and giving it over to God. But it just seemed like he was right there and took them by the hand and walked them through that journey of, as you say, you've got to walk that lonesome valley. You've got to walk it all by yourself. But no, if you know Jesus, you don't have to because he will take you by the hand. He will hold your hand and carry you through those things. John Wesley, when... He was the great founder of the, the Methodist Church, the beginning of the roots of the United Methodist, the Wesleyan Methodist that was following. That was all sprung off together and things. And, and I got to see, and I thought, what a great man. And he said, you want to see, when I was in London, he said, you want to see the church that he pastored? Would you like to see the, and we went on with a bus and looking, and I was thinking of some enormous church. You know, I was thinking, what would be, and I'm, I'm telling you, it would have fitted inside this church. The little building, the little church, would say, such a great man that preached the word of God, and, and then in a remote spot, just a little tombstone that had, 
just that was there. It wasn't any great statue or anything that, that had his birth and had his death and just given the words of his life to understand. He says, the best of all is God is with us. Isn't that wonderful to think about? You've heard the saying, it says, the best is yet to come. And that to think about in the Christian life, you see, today we notice that Jesus' last words are especially significant because when Jesus was about to commit himself to the Father, Jesus reaches back into the Old Testament and from the book of Psalms and poetry that where the psalmist had spoke divinely inspired words in the midst of a trying time within his life, as Jesus hung on the cross in anguish, he called out on those words. You see, Jesus knew the Scripture. Jesus quoted the Scripture. Jesus taught the Scripture. All the different things of what he was doing is that he was following the will of God because the Scripture was the living Word of God. And what he had then was the Old Testament. And Jesus became the New Testament, which is the covenant of God that we have joined together in a personal relationship. That is awesome. But Jesus draws from these words of the psalmist in Psalms 31, verse 5. And the psalmist was longing to be preserved from death. In the psalmist's prayers when he was saying, O Lord God of truth, in Psalms 31, verse 5 when he was committing himself to the Lord, and he was wanting to be protected, to be preserved from death. Lord, if you, and oftentimes that's the way we are when he's crying out in such troubles and, and fear and anguish. But while Jesus, the psalmist, wanted to preserve himself from death, Jesus asked to be preserved through death unto everlasting life. You see, Jesus used the words of this ancient prayer and made them his own. In our text in Luke 23, verse 46, Jesus then, when he was dying, you see, Jesus lived the perfect life. Now he was dying the perfect death. And Jesus interchanged those words out of Psalms 31, verse 5, and Jesus said, Father, into thy hands. Instead of saying, as the psalmist would say, O Lord God. You see, there are many people that say God. And they say, as they cry out to the Creator. You know, I've had people often ask me and say, well, how should I pray? Who are we praying to, God or to who we're praying? Before you're saved, you pray to God. But when you're saved, thank God that Jesus introduced to us and Jesus taught us as He prayed from the cross. Jesus always knew. You see, He, Jesus at the age of 12 said, I must be about my Father's business. If you, if you knew God, you would know me. If you know my Father, you would know me. I and my Father, Jesus would say, are one. In the garden, he would say, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. When his disciples would gather around, and they'd say, teach us how to pray, Lord. And he taught the model of prayer to say, our Father. You see, what happened at the cross was that when Jesus died upon that cross and he cried out from the cross, Father, into thy hands could mend I, my spirit, that he was teaching us that we, what is John 1, 20, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. That we now, so we now, because of Jesus, we too can cry out, Father. Why? Because we are adopted into the family of God through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus proved to us through his, his death upon the cross. And he cried out to the Father. It's possible for you and I and every born-again believer to pray to God and call him Father. The second thing I want you to notice is that we can only find security in God. There's a, an illusion that security can be found in worldly pursuit that drives people to do foolish things. We sacrifice our freedom, we surrender our initiatives, we compromise our ideas, and oftentimes waste our opportunities by wandering off after something that we believe will make us immune to some contingency that threatens us. It won't work. Everything else that you find, try to find security in or to, to think that it's going to be, this is what I'm going to do in my life to follow, it won't work. 
There's no security. In it. It, will, it will fail. It will fall somewhere along the way. You'll find it coming up short. A foreign ambassador once warned us here in America and said this, uh, that we ought to be on guard trying to establish a society that confuses comfort and civilization. You see, when you do that, if you're not careful as a nation or as an individual, we attempt to save our lives and we end up losing it by forgetting the strength of our character, both national and personal, because those things are only forged in the furnace of discipline. You see, it takes hard work. Hard work must precede success. Suffering and pain must come before there is really true peace that we have to go through that and we understand that and to know. I think as we look at it and say, well, where then is true security to be found? Only in God. And only in the revelation of God through the Lord Jesus Christ because we cannot know God apart from Jesus. There's no way to do that. Jesus found his security in God. So Jesus found his earthly security and what was he doing? The Father's will. Every time, everything, he said, I must do the Father's will. He said, I must work the work while there is day. But, you know, because the hour is coming when man can't work anymore. You better be doing what God wants you to do in your life right now, the moment within your heartbeat of what you have because you don't know what tomorrow brings. You don't know what your next heartbreak brings, your heartbeat of what comes within your life. As Jesus was saying, I must work the work now of what God is. I must do what God wants me to do now in finding the security of my life to follow him and to do everything God has asked me to do. We'll never find true fulfillment until we surrender ourselves to God's purpose, just like Jesus did. Many years ago, there was a a minister from America that went overseas and visited in a mission. And when he visited the mission, the, there was a doctor there that was doing a major operation. And the doctor asked the minister, said, well, would you like to see the operation? And the minister said, sure. The operation took seven hours. During that time, the, the minister is... The heat was so intense, the ether fumes and the things that was coming, he had to go out and refresh himself. He couldn't stay. And he waited outside until the doctor had finished the surgery. And when the doctor came out, then the minister talked to the doctor and says to him, he said, in this thing, he said, doctor, is this an average day? And the surgeon just simply smiled and he had perspiration coming from his brows, his forehead, and then his hands were trembling with fatigue after he'd done the surgery. And the minister asked him, he said, doctor, he said, how much would you get paid for a surgery like that in America? And the doctor said, several thousand dollars. And the minister inquired and said, well, doctor, he said, how much, how much did you get paid here to do that surgery? The doctor smiled and thought for a moment, looked at him, and, and the doctor thought of the little lady that was pushed in and had only a copper coin, and she, could just, she was in such pain and crying out for help to do it, and as she sat in that chair, and all she had was one little copper coin, and the doctor said to the minister, her gratitude and my master's smile. He said, that's more than enough. There is no money that could pay me for what I find in the peace and the joy within my life. I want to say, dear friend, in the security of knowing God by trusting everything into God's hand. What is important to you within your life? What is the goals that you set? What is it your ambitions and things that you do? Have you forgotten to trust yourself into the hands of God? Because that is the most important thing that you'll ever do within your life. It starts out when you get saved. And then it continues as you give your life to the Lord. Lord, what would you have me to do? What is your will for my life? And, and to follow that direction as, as God would lead. And you say, well, how can we do that? That brings us to our third thing in closing. The first step has to start at the beginning. 
Because no one becomes a Christian by just simply piling up good works. You weren't born into the family to say, my mom and dad were Christians and I was born in a Christian home, so I'm a Christian too. Now, we do treat our politics that way. If mom and dad was a Democrat, I'm a Democrat. Or, or if they were a Republican, I'm a Republican. We're born into it. And I, I'm afraid that there are too many people thinking that somehow we're grandfathered in, that whatever mom and dad or others are saying, that it would simply carry over to say, I'm a Christian because they were a Christian. No, you're not. You could be a Baptist. You could be a Catholic. But you're not a Christian unless you come in that first step to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior and Lord of your life personally, your decision. You agree with the Lord within your heart. You make that decision. And you know when that happened, whether you was a little girl or a little boy, or you were older, or there was a time that come that God really spoke to you and said, it's not about joining the church, it's not about shaking the preacher's hand, but it's coming to that personal, that first step of really trusting God, trusting the Lord Jesus Christ with your eternal destiny by receiving Him as your Savior. You see, the death of Christ at Calvary, was God's redemptive plan to consummate the earth. It was the only way. The weight of our sins drove the nails into the hands of Jesus and into the feet of Jesus. It was our sins that did those things. The resurrection completed the divine drama that was taking place as Jesus, in verse 46 of our text, Luke 23, said, Father into thy hands I commend my spirit. I commit, I give, I surrender myself into your hands. And when he did, he died. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, we have to die. Not only that one time when we get saved, that we die to ourselves, but we continually, Paul, the Apostle Paul said in Philippians, I die daily. Have you found that to be true in your life? is that we have to again and again and again to be crucify our sins, ourselves, before the Lord because we, we keep taking our life back out of the hands of God. I say, you can trust yourself with God. You can trust your life into God's hands, the direction of your life, what God wants you to do, how to live, and everything else, the provisions of what God does within your life. But so often we find ourselves taking it back, taking it back, out of God's hands, we don't fully surrender and yield to the doing of God's will all the way through. You know, a couple of things the Apostle Paul said. Romans, Paul said, the things I want to do, I find myself not doing. Now that probably clarifies a lot of us. And the things that I want to do, I find myself not doing. That was in his Christian life. That was after his getting saved on the Damascus Road, after his preaching to all the churches and the Gospels. It was part of his maturing and growing that there was still a desire to do more for God. You see, as we become Christians and are growing, we are to want to do more for God, shouldn't we? We want to do more. We want to give more. We're not trying to cut God off. We're not trying to say, okay, now I'm, I'm ready, you know, all these things. In fact, the Apostle Paul would say later on, he says, I fought the fight. I've run the race. I've finished the course. There's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. You know, this is the thing. When he comes in his last words to say it's okay, he ended up getting beheaded in Rome. He lived his life. He appealed to go to Rome because he knew he was going to die, but he wanted to carry forth the message, the gospel of the resurrection of Christ, the personal testimony to say, he touched me. What has happened in your life? You see... If we want to know the joy that the Savior knew, 
in the victorious cry at death, then we have to make a complete commitment as he made. We have to literally wager our life on the fact that God not only loves us, is that he provided for our needs in the death of Christ on Calvary and removes all the guilt of our sin. Once you've given your life to Christ, the devil is lying to you to be able to bring back up to you and cause you to remember your past, to defeat you in your mind, your emotions, mentally or whatever, when it comes to that place to doubt it. Listen, listen, if you are uncertain, if you're unsure within your nail it, drive the nails in it as Jesus did and crucify yourself. As Paul said, I am crucified with Christ so that you can know what you know. Nothing else is sufficient. Nothing else is necessary. Nothing else will do. I think it's wonderful when we see the story of Jesus a person that possessed such a quiet confidence. He knew who he was. He was 100% man, but he was 100% God. He never surrendered his godliness at the point when he became God in the flesh. He was both, but he lived, he walked, he breathed, and his life rested in the providence of God and God's will, always about the Father's business. Pilate, didn't have that confidence. He could allow Jesus to go free rather than condemning him to die on the cross. He gave a choice. You want, who you want, Barabbas or, who do you, or, or Jesus? This Jesus. The Sanhedrin, they didn't have that peace. They were disorganized. They were confused. Judas did not have that peace. He went out and hung himself because he thought in all that he was thinking, the frantic mob that was there saying, crucify him, crucify him, didn't have that peace. They were enraged. When you see people enraged and anger and hate and all the different things going, they don't know the Lord of peace. The frightened band of disciples could not claim that peace. They walked away thinking of all those things that were defeated. They went back to the other things they were doing. And sometimes, isn't that true that when we as Christians seem to be let down because of something or this or that within our life, that it doesn't turn out the way we want of whatever it is in life? Because listen, life is not a bed of roses. Just because you become a Christian doesn't mean that everything works out the way that you want it to. But if you are a Christian, it does mean it will work out a way that God will be glorified through the life you live and the choices you make within your life. Particularly when you make that choice of surrender completely, as Jesus did, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I think that we can trust Jesus with our soul salvation, with our life's joy. But if we can't, who else can we look to? Jesus is the only way. But the question is today, if you haven't trusted him, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to trust him as your Savior? If you're really not saved, are you really willing to trust him and say, Jesus, come into my life? I know that you died on the cross for my sins. The angels proclaimed, said, your name shall be called Jesus, for you shall save your people from their sins. Two thieves on the cross are perfect examples. One was self-centered and selfish. If you're, if you're the Christ, come down off that cross and bring us down to save yourself and save us. The other one, though, with humility, looked and said, I can see in Jesus that he has done nothing wrong. We deservingly, we are thieves, we are robbers, we are insurrectious, we're murderers. I'm a sinner. When you come to that place of acknowledgement, dear friend, that you have sin in your life, any sin is distasteful to God. Any sin. And the Bible says all have sinned. Jesus became sin for us on the cross because the way of a transgressor is hard as the Bible says it's hard for us when we sin the way as we travel in our life and it was hard for Jesus
purpose because not that he knew no sin, not that he had sin in his life, but he became sin upon the cross for us. So that final words of the text that Jesus would say, Father, so affectionate, so loving, that he cries out that he hadn't forgotten who he was, that he's the Son of God and he hadn't forgotten that God was up looking above. And even there was a time when God turned his back, when Jesus was crying out because he couldn't look down at the pain and the suffering of his son. For God so loved the world that he gave he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Pray with me. Thank you, Father, for touching our hearts through your word today. And as we yield ourselves in this invitation moment of trusting you, Lord, help us to surrender all. Not just partly as it works out for us, or as a convenience. But Lord, that it will come to the place that we look at nothing else but you and to say, I completely surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me, please? As we sing in our invitation, if you're in the back of the church, the front, the middle, wherever you are, I don't know, but as God is speaking to your heart, it is a personal decision. You can't make that because of someone else. It just won't work. But when you make it privately here within your heart and you bring that forth publicly to announce the Lord Jesus as Savior and Lord of your life, where you're going to follow him, live for him, that's saying something. You're taking a stand. You're letting other people know. It takes away all the doubts. Let's sing. Come every soul by Quickly. As God has spoken to your heart, you come. You need to move your letter to this church. Rededicate your life. Pray around this altar. Surrender your life. You come. Are you doing it? Next verse. For Jesus shed his precious blood, rich blessings to Christ. He's calling right now. Come on. You're in the middle of the aisle. Somebody step back and let you come. next verse, Bill. This will be the last verse unless someone comes. Yes, it's your verse. You'll end this invitation. God's people said, it is so good to have you in the house of the Lord today and those that are watching by Facebook live stream with us and I hope and pray if there's a need that, you know, we can reach out. The word is powerful and someone's sitting on their couch or whatever and watching in their bedroom uh, can make that decision for Christ. We would like to hear from folks that are watching live stream if you've made a decision for Christ. Let us know so we can pray and with you and celebrate with you. And the same thing here. You know, yeah, there's a sense of a private thing, 
But you know, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. There's also that sense of public that you don't want to be a secret disciple. You want to let people know that you've taken a stand for the Lord. Word from anyone before we go today. Word from anyone. Good to be here. Amen. God is good all the time, isn't he? Amen. Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, don't forget work day, Saturday, is see, what time? Of course, if you want to come earlier, you can.